Good afternoon. My name is CJ Taylor. I am a professor in the Computer and Information Science Department, and I am currently the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the School of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Pennsylvania. On behalf of Dean Vijay Kumar, I would like to welcome you all to the inaugural Joseph Bordonia Forum. Dean Kumar was very much looking forward to giving this introduction himself. Unfortunately, he has been unavoidably detained this week, so the honor of introducing our inaugural speaker falls to me. The impetus for this forum came out of the events of this past summer, the murder of George Floyd, the protests here in Philadelphia and across the nation, and the awareness that as an educational institution, we needed to provide forums to discuss issues that lay at the intersection of technology, education, and society. As engineers, we pride ourselves on inventing the future and thus shaping society. But it is also the case that society shapes our field it shapes the faces of our profession, the ideas we come up with, and the systems and structures that we build. It is in that context that we propose to provide forums to explore these issues and discuss ideas that will help us to build a more just and a more inclusive future. In putting together the concept for this forum, it was immediately obvious that we had a perfect example to guide our thinking in the person and the career of Dr. Joseph Bordonia who was the Alfred Fittler Moore Professor of Engineering in the Electrical and Systems Engineering Department here at Penn. In 1981, Dr. Bardonia became Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. During his first year in office, he worked with Cora Ingram to found the Office of Minority Programs, which would evolve to become the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. This year, we will be celebrating the 40th anniversary of that founding, which we can trace back to the foresight and leadership of Cora Ingram and Dean Bordonia. Dean Bordonia was also instrumental in the founding of the Prime Program, which focused on exposing minority students in Philadelphia area high schools to careers in STEM fields. As a graduate of the John Bartram High School here in Philadelphia, he was deeply committed to investing in the future of this city and in opportunities for all of its citizens. In 1991, Dean Bordonia became head of the National Science Foundation's Engineering Directorate, and in 1996, he became the NSF's Deputy Director. As a leader of the NSF, Dean Bordonia pioneered the phrase broader impacts, which conveyed both to researchers and to Congress the impact that research could have on the broader population, and encouraged the entire research community to think more deeply about issues around diversity and inclusion. Over the past year, I've had conversations with a number of people who have commented on how his vision for a more just society and his desire to share opportunity more broadly impacted their life and shaped their career. I can think of no greater legacy for an educator. We are grateful to have had Professor Bordoni as part of our community for so many years and look forward to honoring his memory and his many contributions with this forum. Before we proceed, a quick word on the remainder of our program. After Dr. Slaughter speaks, he and I will be joined by other panelists and we will hold a moderated question and answer session and panel discussion. Please submit your questions at that time via the Q&A feature of this Zoom call. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our inaugural speaker, Dr. John Brooks Slaughter, who currently holds a joint appointment between the Rossier School of Education and the Viterbi School of Engineering at the University of Southern California. In 1956, Dr. Slaughter began his career as an engineer at General Dynamics Convair, which he left in 1960 to work as a civilian at the United States Naval Electronics Laboratory Center in San Diego. He worked for the Navy for 15 years, becoming director of the Information Systems Technology Department. From there, he went on to become director of the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle. In 1977, he joined the National Science Foundation as assistant director of the Astronomical, Atmospheric, Earth and Ocean, Ocean Sciences Directorate. And in 1980, he returned to the, to the NSF to become the first African-American to lead that foundation. In 1982, he became the chancellor of the University of Maryland where he spearheaded efforts to recruit and retain African-American students and faculty. In 1988, Dr. Slaughter became the president of Occidental College, 
transforming the school during his 11 year tenure into one of the most diverse liberal arts colleges in America. In 2000, he became the president and CEO of the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, whose mission is to increase the number of engineers of color. Dr. Slaughter has received numerous honors and awards for his work. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He is also in the Hall of Fame of the American Society for Engineering Education. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and the Tau Beta Pi Honorary Engineering Society. He has received honorary degrees from 25 institutions, and it is our great pleasure to welcome him here today as our inaugural speaker. And now I would like to turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Slaughter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. I appreciate the generous introduction. And I certainly want to thank Dean B.J. Kumar for inviting me to deliver this inaugural Joseph Bordonia address. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Borgnoni at one point in my career, and it is an extremely tremendous honor for me to speak with you at this forum named for him. At this point in our history, we are faced with many critical and potentially cataclysmic events and crises. There are three that come to my mind immediately. The first, is climate change. The second is the novel pandemics. The third is the crisis caused by the ignominious history of racism and anti-Blackness, the unwillingness to acknowledge and accept the humanity of Black people that has crippled our nation for over 400 years. The common thread that runs through these each of these monstrous and intractable problems is the fact that engineers have a role to play in identifying and developing answers for their solutions. The broad multiracial, multicultural reaction to the tragic and senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Eric Garner, as well as many others, at the hands and knee of police officers, and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery by armed vigilantes have led to a wide variety of actions among the many institutions that have expressed alarm and have pledged to work to not only identify and remove systemic and structural barriers to the inclusion and success of Black individuals in their organizations, but to also strive to improve the circumstances of Black Americans in the larger society. The names of slave owners have been removed from buildings and universities throughout the country. The statues of Confederate generals the stone ghosts of the South, as they were called by journalist Tramine Lee, have been toppled. Among the institutions that have expressed allegiance to the Black Lives Matter movement have vowed support for anti-Blackness efforts or professional organizations, honorary societies, and engineering associations. Even NFL players are displaying signs that say end racism or Black Lives Matter on their helmets, shoes, and uniforms. And NBA players have canceled games. All of these are extremely encouraging developments was far too long. Many of the organizations and institutions that are now on board have been on the periphery 
of racial justice and have at most provided rhetoric with little in the way of action in addressing these inequities. We have seen discrimination and implicit biases in many of the organizations and they need to, they need to stop. It is my intent in this address to point out why I believe that a cultural transformation is needed in the profession of engineering and in many of its institutional organizations and in its practitioners, if we are to participate meaningfully in the efforts to create a more racially just and inclusive American society. At this critical moment in our nation's history, we need more than words that renounce racism and anti-Blackness, a time in which white supremacists have been emboldened. We need actions to abolish racism and anti-Blackness. Not only must we be mindful of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But also the words added by the late Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said, but only if there is a steadfast commitment to completing the task. When I was chancellor of the University of Maryland College Park, I co-taught co a class in the African American Studies Department. On the first day of class, I went to the board and wrote what I somewhat lightheartedly referred to as Slaughter's Theorem. It read, Black studies is for white students. Math, physics, and chemistry are for black students. There is no doubt that I could have been accused of unbridled hyperbole at the time, but I believed what I had written. I believe it even more today. In what follows, I will try to explain why. First, it is imperative that white Americans come to understand and hopefully appreciate the lived experiences of black Americans throughout the history of our presence in this country. From the egregious and repressive 245 years of slavery that has left a legacy that continues to haunt us all today. The aborted period of reconstruction, the Fugitive Slave Act, the slave patrols, the lynching of black men and women for meaningless or non-existent reasons, the bombing of the 16th Street Black, Church, Black Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, that killed the four little girls, the discriminatory practices in employment, education, healthcare, housing, the criminal justice system. The story of Blacks in America needs to be known. The negative effects of the history of white supremacy are evident today in the COVID-19 pandemic in which black Americans are disproportionately affected both medically and economically. It is not hard to understand why the presence of white supremacists today makes us fear for the lives of our children and grandchildren. No longer should any of us accept the excuse, I didn't know. White Americans must come to understand the harm that white supremacy has on them, just as it has on the black people for whom it is targeted. They must be able to understand what James Baldwin, Baldwin meant 
when he said, to be black in America is to be in constant rage. I believe it was Amer uh, Abraham Lincoln who declared, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are affected. So long as some believe and behave as though they are unaffected by the systemic and structural racism embedded in the way our society has and continues to operate, the meaningful and difficult conversations, the conversations not for the purpose of assigning guilt or blame, but rather to finding understanding and agreement will not occur. But they must occur if we are to rid ourselves of the fear of the other, the yoke that prevents us from becoming a nation where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. And there is hopefully regard for the opinions of others and engineers must be at the table where these conversations take place. Second, we are at a moment when this country can ill afford to ignore the talents that exist in those persons who have been historically underrepresented, underrecognized, and underappreciated in science and technology. We must recognize that America cannot and will not retain a prominent position in the STEM skills so long as anyone is prevented or impeded from the fullest possible opportunity to participate and contribute to our scientific, technological, and engineering activities and achievements. The economic condition, productivity, and welfare of our citizens depends upon it. Given the inevitability of future pandemics and the current and impending consequences of climate change, our very survival depends upon preparing and marshalling all the talent we can possibly develop. We must then, as former IBM Executive Vice President for Innovation and Technology, Nicholas D'Onofrio pointed out to me, make sure that opportunity is there to meet the talent. I have long contended that diversity drives innovation, but mere diversity is not enough. While diversity is necessary, it is not sufficient to ensure that an institution practices equity and inclusion and increases the possibilities for innovation and creativity. As Stephanie Farrell, the 2018 president of the American Society of Engineering Education said, diversity is about counting heads. Equity is about making heads count. I believe that this is the time that we must commit ourselves to making engineering a professional discipline that is an example of equity and inclusion. While most Americans are aware of the many significant contributions that Blacks have made in fields such as music, art, literature, and poetry, the same is not true for science and engineering. All too often, their achievements in these areas have been unknown or unrecognized, or if known, have been disregarded or denigrated. Racism and sexism were embedded in the scientific and artistic ethos of America long before Benjamin Banneker 
and Phyllis Wheatley sought acknowledgement from Thomas Jefferson for their respective talents as scientist and poet. Benjamin Banneker, 1731 to 1806, was a free black Maryland resident, a self-taught mathematician, clock builder, almanac creator, and surveyor, who assisted in surveying, who assisted in surveying the original boundaries of Washington, DC, and whose astronomical observations and studies were devalued and discredited by Thomas Jefferson and by others. Much the same was true for Norbert Reelview, 1804 to 1896, one of the earliest chemical engineers and inventor of the multiple effect evaporator. For I, Elijah McCoy, 1844 to 1929, engineer and inventor of lubrication devices for steam locomotives. For Louis Latimer, 1844 to 1848 to 1928, who in 1881 was issued a patent for the process for developing the carbon filament for light bulbs prior to joining Thomas Edison in the creation of the first incandescent bulb. And for Granville T. Woods, 1856 to 1910, who invented a telegraph system that made railroads safer. And for Garrett Morgan, 1877 to 1963, inventor of the three position traffic light. How many computer scientists and engineers know that African-American engineers such as Mark Dean, a co-inventor of the personal computer, holds three of the nine original patents for the IBM PC, or that James West invented the microphone technology on the cell phone you, you have in your pocket, both of whom, incidentally, have been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And how many know that Black scientists and engineers, Drs. Gilda Barabino, Shirley Ann Jackson, Gary May, Daryl Pines, Freeman Hebrowski, and Gregory Washington are presidents of some of America's most highly regarded research universities. And that former Cornell Dean of Engineering, Lance Collins, is the executive director of Virginia Tech's new innovation campus. Yes, Black Americans have been and are contributors to this nation's might and capabilities in science, technology, and engineering. If we were to eliminate the systematic racial impediments that crush the aspirations and potentialities of so many Black Americans, our nation would be not only more just and equitable, but it would be one that has even greater capacity for innovation and productivity. We must let opportunity meet talent. It is no secret that the field of engineering falls well behind medicine, law, and many other professions when it comes to the commitment and practice of social justice activities. For the most part, engineering education has not afforded engineering students with the exposure to the liberal arts and social science courses that would prepare them for seeing engineering in terms of its service to humanity. But I contend that the grand challenges for engineering 
the 14 global problems identified by the National Academy of Engineering will require more than science and mathematics to solve. Securing cyberspace, restoring urban infrastructure, and advancing personalized learning, just three of the grand challenges, will require a profound understanding of matters such as the politics, economics, cultures, languages, religions, aspirations, fears, and histories of the societies and people who will be affected by and who will be users of the technologies developed by engineers to address and solve those problems. No longer should anyone tolerate the design of a highway, bridge, or light rail system that displaces a black neighborhood or business community to advantage suburbanites on their commutes to and from the central city. Engineers need to recognize our social responsibilities in helping to make healthcare more affordable and available for the poor and underserved, to apply our critical thinking and problem solving abilities to the inequities in performance and success of minority children in our public educational systems and address the critical problems that exist in our criminal justice systems. A colleague at the University of Southern California, Professor Anthony Maddox and I co-founded a center in the USC Rossier School of Education. The Center for Engineering and Education, which we, we refer to as simply CEE because we are both electrical engineers, was conceived in response to the fact that the next generation of st science standards provide for the first time that engineering design be included in this curriculum for all K through 12 students. While we applaud, while we applaud the inclusion of engineering principles and concepts in elementary and secondary school science courses, we recognize that teachers in those settings are not likely to have had the necessary background and preparation to teach engineering design. We believe that the solution lies in personalized learning with the aid of the intelligent introduction and use of technology. And this will be the principal way in which formal, non-formal, and informal learning will take place in the future. We also support the idea that many people have proposed and pursued of expanding STEM to STEAM, where the A is usually thought to refer to as the arts. But we contend that the A could easily be interpreted as any discipline because of our belief that engineering thinking can inform and improve teaching and learning. We have also in consideration of the emphasis on the need for addressing social justice and systemic racism, racism have coined STEAM, S-T-E-E-M, where the additional E calls for equity to be, included, to be included as an essential component of STEM education. The E could also be considered as ethics or empathy, both of which are much needed ingredients in our society today. And last, but certainly not least, Higher education has an important role to play. Although numerous encouraging transformations have taken place, I find many of the moralistic pronouncements by some of our most prestigious educational institutions 
in the wake of the recent Black Lives Matter protests and demonstrations to be disingenuous and off-putting. For too many years, these institutions have had the opportunity and the responsibility to address the structural racism that marginalizes Black Americans and deters them from the opportunities available to others, but have failed to do so. The dearth of Black, Brown, and Indigenous persons on the faculties of our major research universities is higher education's Achilles heel and shame. This is particularly true for the STEM disciplines. While the presence of Black tenure and tenure track faculty in most large research universities hovers around 6%, it is often 1% or 2% or less in science and engineering departments. The pipeline is not full enough. The excuse that engineering search committees have habitually used has become trite and no longer as true as it once may have been. What it too often means is that they do not want to make the extra effort to find and recruit minority candidates, or even worse, have no desire to do so. Our colleges can and must do better. I hope they will develop the resolve to do so. Engineering schools can start out by reaching out to historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions to develop relationships with their faculties and students. They should be proactive in efforts to recruit a more diverse set of faculties and students. They should be, pro they should be proactive rather than waiting for responses to ads in journals and newsletters. They should find ways to inform and encourage black, brown, and indigenous engineering undergraduates to consider graduate study in preparation for academic, an academic career. They must recognize the importance of removing those structural impediments with their own organizations that discourage minority students and impair their ability to succeed. Schools of engineering should reevaluate their core values and become equity minded rather than deficit minded in their approach to ensuring a fair and equitable educational experience for all students. Too many have adopted a false sense of meritocracy. They should focus less on being elite and instead strive to be excellent in the broadest sense of that word. They must come to recognize that excellence and equity are not mutually exclusive and that it is possible to have both quality and equality at the same time and each at their best. Change must begin within. An important first step was taken a few years ago when Giannis Yorksos, the Dean of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering, spearheaded an effort that led to more than 200 engineering schools and colleges pledging to provide increased opportunity to engineering careers for underrepresented groups and to ensure educational experiences that are inclusive and that prevent marginaliz marginalization of any groups of people. These schools affirm the importance of these aims as a reflection of their core values and as a source of inspiration for drawing a generation to the call of improving the human condition. I trust that Penn is one of those schools. I will conclude 
by saying that I believe the events of the past few months where white supremacy and anti-blackness have been on display in ways not seen in recent years. These events have opened a window of opportunity that we cannot afford to allow to close without making major strides in guiding the discipline of engineering toward becoming a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive profession. None of us can continue to hide behind the time-worn excuse of, I am too busy. Furthermore, there must be a sense of urgency for us to do so. Martin Luther King Jr. expressed the importance of urgency in his usual and elegant manner. He said, we are faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy and complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. He went on to say we must use time creatively and always remember that the time is ripe to do right. The no trespassing sign in the Kansas countryside says it much less elegantly but much more directly. The sign reads, if you want to cross this field, you better do it in 9.9 .9 seconds. The bull can do it in 10 flat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Seale. Wonderful address. So uh, at this time, I will uh, like to invite uh, two of my colleagues uh, to join us as part of the panel. So if they'll... Uh, Go ahead and unmute. Uh, so uh, first to join us is uh, Dr. Jennifer Lucas, who is a uh, professor in the Mechanical Engineering and Applied Me Mechanics Department here at Penn. We're also joined by uh, da Deo Adewole. Uh, Deo did his undergraduate work here at Bioengineering, and then he did his uh, the Robotics Master's Program uh, here at Penn. I always feel compelled to point that out since I uh, directed that program for a number of years. And he just defended his PhD in bioengineering uh, uh, here as well. So we're really pleased to have uh, them uh, both with us. So uh, as we said at the, at the top, uh, we are going to be moderated question and answer um, uh, discussion. So uh, please place your questions in the Q&A uh, slot that you'll find hopefully to the bottom right hand of the, of the screen. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, we have uh, some questions that have been put into the Q&A uh, section. So uh, again, if you do have questions, uh, please do put them in the Q&A uh, the Q and A section uh, uh, in your Zoom screen at the bottom. So the first question that uh, I wanted to ask uh, is from Lango Dean from U.S. Black Engineer Magazine, uh, and the question is: Congratulations from Black Engineer Magazine, Dr. Slaughter. My question is: You have been a part of a cohort of people like Shirley Ann Jackson, Daryl Pines, and Anthony Maddox, uh, who a new generation of engineers and scientists look up to as teachers, mentors, and leaders. What do you have for them? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of your of your question, Jennifer. You cut out there. Oh, sure. So. Uh, uh, what advice do you have for the new generation of leaders, uh, for the new generation of engineers and scientists uh, as engineers? Well, I believe very, very strongly that, uh, first of all, um, students should follow their passion. Um, the path to becoming a successful engineer um, or scientist is one that requires uh, 
a considerable amount of commitment to to uh, to the task. Um, you need to be passionate about it. You need to be persistent. You need to realize that it's not going to come easy. It's it's going to require require you to to place it as a very high priority in order to be in order to be successful. I I believe very strongly that uh, that. Uh, Young people need to be willing to, to take some intelligent risks in pursuing, uh, pursue, pursuing a career, um, but they have to believe in, in what it is that they're doing. This is an incredibly exciting time to enter science and engineering. And it is important, I think, for young people to, to recognize that uh, the opportunities are, are abundant and they just need to commit themselves to, to the idea that I can be successful and not allow anyone to deter them from being able to do so. I tell young people all the time that the first thing they should do is to realize that they cannot afford to take no from a, a, a counselor or, or a teacher, um, but the to know that they have the ability to succeed. All right, so that was a great answer. So uh, Dr. Slaughter, let me uh, follow this up. There's something that's been raised by a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, people in the chat. They're pointing to the uh, importance of sort of the K-12 system and sort of the challenges and opportunities as afforded. And as the sp pace of technology increases, and, I, and as, as I believe you mentioned, um, in some sense, the, the uh, gatekeeping courses for engineering in terms of advanced mathematics, advanced physics, advanced chemistry are in, in some sense increasingly important. Um, and uh, you have had, in your career, you've sort of uh, sat in a number of positions that, that give you different perspectives on, on what those challenges are and on strategies that we might be able to use to help address it. I was just wondering if you could uh, share your insights. Well, you've pointed out something that's exceedingly important. Uh, there has been a study that indicated that more black and brown uh, youngsters are interested in becoming engineers than their white peers. But at the same time, we have found out uh, that only about 4% of black and brown uh, high school graduates have taken the necessary courses to complete uh, or to enroll in engineering school. And this is because so many of these, um, these students have been in under-resourced um, elementary and secondary schools that don't offer the courses or don't have the, the uh, same quality instruction that they need to, to be successful when they enter engineering school. It is also because so many of them have not had the role models or, or mentors that uh, can be so helpful in propelling them along the pathway to, be, to, to, becoming, uh, to becoming engineers. So I think it's, it is incredibly important for them to recognize that um, they need to, to take every opportunity that they can to uh, uh, to become prepared and not let uh, those impediments uh, uh, prevent them from, from uh, uh, pursuing their goal, their dream, their aspirations to be scientists and engineers. But we, we need to make sure we strengthen the education that they receive in their elementary and secondary schools. And we need to make certain that those of us who have the opportunity, provide mentorship and support for them um, because uh, this is lacking in so many of their lives and is, is one reason why we see so few um, uh, enter um, engineering study and become successful. There's a question uh, in the Q&A about what is the role of individual lab groups in equity and racial justice uh, while we wait for higher level, levels of academia to organize? So I think that uh, 
as with a lot of things, the, the person in charge of the lab really has a responsibility to set the tone um, for what, what to explore when it comes to bringing a conscious focus on equity um, and on racial justice into active lab activities, whether that be engaging with the community more, uh, whether that be you know taking a census of the lab itself to look at the makeup of the lab and see how um, any biases, unconscious or not, they contribute to what may be seen as a lack of diversity if it exists, um, a lack of accessibility if it exists. But really, I think fundamentally, uh, the the first step for lab groups or really any group is is education, like education of the self with respect to what these issues are. I mean, these while they are very complex, um, they are issues that experts, similar to an expert in cell engineering. Um, like they're experts in, in racial justice and in equity, um, especially within the context of research. And looking at the history is, I think, kind of at the utmost importance before beginning to take actions that either may not be as efficient or maybe in some way uh, compromised, again, by those unconscious biases. So in terms of individual lab groups, just being able to create an environment where that type of education is uh, is accommodated for or is supported in some way, I think is a, is a pretty good first step for people who are looking to do that. Well, I think you've made uh, some important points here, Dayo. And it goes back to, the, to what I was saying earlier about uh, the fact that, that uh, leaders of, of uh, of our universities, and particularly in our in our research and and uh, engineering study departments and our laboratories, need to recognize that they have to understand much more fully the experiences of all the students that they are leading and 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 teaching. Um, and that's why I pointed out uh, why it is essential for faculty members to understand more fully the experiences of the young people that, uh, that, that they are responsible for guiding. Um, they need to have an appreciation for, for the exper experiential background um, of, of, these, of their charges and to know why some of the implicit biases and microaggressions are offensive and are, are barriers to the student's, student success. It also requires that they, that they, as I tried to point out, have a, an appreciation for things be, beyond science, engineering, and technology. They have to have an appreciation for the human condition and for the social environment that, that uh, surrounds uh, the, these students and all of us, as a matter of fact. And without that, uh, they cannot be as successful as they need to be to be the mentors and, and the, and the uh, supporters of, of these students' aspirations. I, I think it's, it's critically important that, that uh, faculty members and and directors of our laboratories and research institutions um, are willing to be vulnerable enough to um, share with their students on a personal basis their own experiences and their own level of understanding of, the, of uh, social justice. Because it's important that a level of trust be established between uh, faculty leaders, faculty members, and their students. And without that trust, it is going to be very, very difficult for them to, to uh, be the, the mentors and uh, successful teachers of these students. So I, I, I think that that is critically important. There has to be a connection between the, the, uh, the leaders and, and their students. And without that, it's going to be very, very hard to achieve an equitable and inclusive um, um, relationship. One of the things that you had mentioned uh, earlier on is that 
you know, universities cannot be sort of passive bystanders waiting for the applications to roll in and, and, and that, that we have to take an active role to uh, foster uh, diversity and inclusion. And uh, one of the questions uh, uh, that, that uh, I'm seeing here in the Q&A is what myths, if any, exist about what works in retaining people of color in engineering fields? So what are the, you know, what are the myths and then what are the things that, that, that help to uh, improve retention? Well, it's it's important as 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 I as I tried to to point out for faculty members if they wish to improve the retention of underrepresented um, uh, students in in, uh, in 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 engineering in their in their courses is that they realize that that uh, oftentimes there has to be more than just simply um, um, introducing scientific and math, science and math principles without understanding the, the uh, peculiar uh, backgrounds, the unique backgrounds that so many of these students bring. Um, one of the reasons that uh, historically black colleges and universities are successful is that the faculty members, as, as I said earlier, develop a relationship with their students. Um, so that first of all, the students know that they're not imposters in, in these classes, that uh, they are there because they have the capacity to be successful and to encourage them to be successful rather than treating them as students that come in with deficits. Um, that perhaps is the biggest barrier to the, those students being successful, not feeling that they are, first of all, welcome and not feeling that they are considered to be um, um, students who are going to end up being successful. And oftentimes faculty members, sometimes inadvertently, uh, tend to give uh, students a sense that uh, somehow they are not quite as capable as, as some others. And this is a huge impediment to their being successful. So Dr. Slaughter, I think this actually is a question that follows on nicely to, to one of your answers to your previous questions is they, um, what do you feel uh, coursework in humanities, how do you feel that coursework in humanities can help uh, engineering become a more equitable field both in society at large? Well, you know, it's, it, I, I believe very strongly that, that we have sometimes um, trained our students rather than educated them. Um, and one has to recognize that so much of what it is that engineers have to do in addressing the important problems that face society mean that they have to have a broader education than has historically been the case in, in engineering education. Um, and that broader education has to include um, a sense of the humanities and the social sciences. I, I believe that, that uh, engineering is moving into a new phase um, where we are introducing uh, ideas and, 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 and concepts that we have not in the past introduced. Uh, engineering now um, um, ties in much more strongly with, with uh, um, biological principles than it did say 30 years ago. Um, and engineers need to have an appreciation for, for some of the, the uh, concerns that uh, everyone in society is facing. And without being exposed to those and being made to, to and being helped to understand those, I think engineering is crippling itself. 
um, and that uh, our um, artifacts that we produce are not going to be as meaningful and as useful to the large to, to a larger society than it could be. So it is critically important, I think, for some that somehow engineering education moves in a direction that uh, includes some of the humanities and social sciences and arts um, in the education of our students. Some people um, re are resistant to that because they think it requires extending an engineering education. Um, if so, I think that that's a small price to pay. I believe it is critically important that we do that. Kind of building on that, there's a question uh, by Osaka. It's a two-parter, but I want to talk about the second one since it follows up. Um, changes to the engineering curriculum and how they could be, how this could be changed to create more academically well-rounded engineers. Uh, there, like if you look in the news, really, there are several examples of technology that's been used in some way to either further some sort of oppressive dynamic or where it's clear that within the design of the technology, uh, you know, one go-to example is uh, one of the automatic sink that doesn't recognize black skin, right? So people, so black people can't like wash their hands in certain bathrooms. I think being able to pull more examples from the real world and walk students through the history um, of how those changes or how those dynamics uh, came to be and how technology can further those without actually and explicitly considering the social implications being able to include that in an engineering curriculum uh, and including that earlier on, I think would be hugely beneficial in terms of improving the, the roundedness of engineers when it comes to social awareness. Well, it would be beneficial. I, I, I think that um, engineers need to not just understand the, the uh, physical and natural constraints when they take on a problem. They need to understand the, the uh, economic constraints, the political constraints, the, uh, the uh, concerns of the people who are going to use that, that, uh, that technology. Um, and without that, um, there is a shortfall in the, in the uh, success of the, uh, of the products that, that that uh, that they produce, um, I just I just think that somehow we have to figure out how to introduce some of those um, social concepts in an engineering education. I don't think it's going to be that difficult, um, but it's also going to require that our faculty members uh, have a broader perspective. Um, and so they have to be educated as well um, in order for them to educate the students. And uh, um, it just, just means that uh, we have got to, to recognize that this cultural transformation must take place if our, if our future engineers are going to be able to, to address uh, the, the significant challenges that are that are facing society now and that uh, are evolving and will become more significant in the future. Well, I, I notice uh, by the uh, time on, the, uh, on, our, on my clock that we've uh, uh, reached five o'clock. Uh, so this seems like a wonderful time at which to thank uh, our speaker. Dr. Slaughter, this has uh, been a, a wonderful event. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, and I want to thank uh, our panelists. And of course, everybody has been participating in the Q&A. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to, to address all of the questions, but we will try to capture, sort of uh, uh, make use of them uh, going forward. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, uh, thank again our speaker. And um, we look forward to having many more Joseph Bordonia forums going forward. This was, will hopefully be, hopefully be a, a, a remain a keystone event in our calendar. Um, as we proceed. So thank you all for atten your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.